ready to worship the Lord, ready to open His Word, ready to get into the into the Scripture today. We're going to do that. So that's right. We're, I, I love your excitement about that. So Chris Sangskin wrote a book entitled "Quit Church," and let me show it to you. Uh, this is the book that Chris Sanskin wrote. Title Quit Church. The uh, subtitle of his book is Because Your Life Would Be Better If You Did. Wow. Quit church because your life would be better if you did. I'd never heard that before because, I don't know, growing up when I was a kid, they told me that I kind of had a healthy dose of curiosity. I don't know if that was a compliment. I suppose that's because I ask a lot of questions. And, and along the way, just so you know, it didn't always serve me well in my life. My, my parents didn't always appreciate my curiosity, and I wasn't fond, quite frankly, of their answer because I said so. I, I needed a little more. Maybe you were the same. I, I needed you to explain to me why we do certain things that we do. Why do we do some of this stuff around here? I, I, and so I got in a lot of trouble because I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why I had to go to bed at 8 while they got to stay up as late as they wanted. I didn't get it. And I wondered why I had to eat broccoli and carrots when, I was, when it was obvious I didn't like it. Uh, so I asked some questions. Did you? I didn't understand why I had to kiss my aunt when no one else liked her. So what was up with that? And I didn't understand why my parents had to whip me. If it really hurt them more than it hurts me, hey, why don't we just let this thing slide, right? One of the things I didn't understand as a child is why we had to go to church every Sunday. I mean, my friends didn't go every Sunday. And did I already say every Sunday? Sunday, and I don't know if you got the picture, so let me say it again. Every Sunday, I can count on one hand when we didn't go to church. We didn't stay at home because somebody was tired. We, we didn't miss church because you didn't feel good. We didn't miss church because of soccer games or AAU basketball or traveling baseball. Did I already say every Sunday? What well, didn't make sense to me, Ty, it didn't make sense to me that all that, that in school, you, you know, you get out in May and you go back in September, there's a, what we call a summer break. And I, I just wondered, I mean, why didn't we take a summer break in church? I'm just saying, it didn't make sense to me. And here's the deal. We didn't just go to church on Sunday. Oh, no. No, we didn't just go to church on Sunday. We stayed at church. Sunday school. Morning worship, get with me here, church training, uh, training union, you know, uh, but, uh, we, we, discipleship training, evening worship, and then Wednesday night, we've got Bible study and prayer time, and, and, and by the way, we're going to have an RA meeting, Royal Ambassadors, you know, little guys, we're going to do stuff, and, and then on Monday night, we're going to have visitation, and then Saturday morning, we're going to have bus ministry visitation. I, I mean, listen, it, it was a little tough, it's a little tough for me when I hear these modern parents say, uh, you know, my kids just didn't really feel like going to church today. I didn't know you could feel like going to church. I, I just felt like I had to go to church. So, so Chris Sankson comes along and he writes this book called Quit Church. And the title really caught my attention. And I've been learning even before I read this book that there's a big difference between going to church, get with me, Welcome back. going to church and being the church. I want you to watch this. Turn this guy up if you would. Or at least the modern attitude towards church and taking a more active role in their religious community. That pastor, Chris Sonskin, author of Quit Church, Your Life Will Be Better If You Do, joins us now with more. Pastor, great to have you with us. I, I read this, the, the title of your book, and it definitely catches your attention. But I love what you're getting at here because it's the idea that it's one thing to go to church and it is another to spend your life every single day to actually help people, to give back to your community in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. I really do appreciate it. And yeah, the idea of the, the book Quit Church uh, is it's not about quitting church. I'm not telling people, hey, stop going to church. Uh, but uh, I'd be crucified. But um, <laughs> it's not that. It's about quitting our approach towards it. You know, we've uh, uh, we've just our approach towards church and towards the things of God and uh, we just kind of, you know, we're losing uh, what it really is all about and, and uh, getting plugged in. There's so many things that God wants to do in all of our lives, but we miss out on so much because of 
our sort of casual approach towards really the principles of God and uh, and what the local church provides and being involved with that local church. People would say, if you don't go to church, though, how are you reminded to give back? Because you've seen the numbers. I mean, I'm looking at this Pew poll back from 2014, and it shows that just 36% of Americans attend religious services weekly. And those are ones that uh, just admit that. Who knows what the real numbers are? And that was from years ago, and the numbers keep going down. Right, right. So if you don't go to church, who is out there to remind you to be better? No, I, I, let me be clear. I'm definitely telling people to go to church. I think that people need to be in church. I think they need to be in a local church that they can get involved with, that they can get plugged in with. What I'm saying is it's such a casual approach towards mm -hmm. that we have towards it. The average person last year that, that called themselves a, a faith-driven person only went 19 out of 52 Sundays. You know, not so many people are being involved with the heart of generosity in a church or serving in a church. And so what I'm saying yeah. to anybody that is somewhat going to church, hey, man, don't approach it casually. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about it, anything that you want, you want out of life, if you want something better out of life, you got to quit. You know, if you want a degree, you got to quit watching so much TV. If you right. want to do better financially, Be genuine you got to quit it. spending your money. Yeah, yeah exactly. so you got to quit certain things. And so, man, we've got we to be more genuine and say, you know what, I, I want everything that God has for my life. And so Christian or not, God wants incredible things for your life. you just kind of got to dive all in. And I always like to say it this way. If you go all in, God will go all out. Why do you see the numbers continuing to go down? And how do we as a society, as a country, uh, fix that? How do we say, you know, more of us need to believe in something bigger than ourselves? Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and it is. It, it uh, you know, back in the '50s, you know, they would never, wouldn't even imagine having uh, little league and other things on Sunday because church was just so that important. And it just seems like it's become more and more casual. And so we kind of approach church and God and sort of the way that we want to approach it and the involvement that we want. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it, you know, life gets busy, things get busy, and I get all that. I really do. Uh, but at some point we have to stop and say, okay, God, if you're really a God that loves us, you're really a God that really wants the absolute best for our life, yeah. then God, we got to go all in. Right. And, uh, and uh, that's what pastors, uh, I talk to a lot of pastors Chris, across the nation, and that's kind of one thing great, they're really struggling with. It's a great yeah. message. We have to go to break, but go get your book. It's awesome. Yeah. We will see you soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great message, but hurry up. we got to go do something else. Hey, so, so now you have a little better idea kind of about what this book is. I highly recommend it. I encourage you uh, to buy it, go to Amazon, pick it up, quit church, because your life would be better if you did. And so here's what I want to do today. I, I want to talk a lot about the difference between going to church and being the church. And we're going to spend a little time with it, because I've learned there's a huge difference between going to church and being the church. And so with that in mind, here's what I want you to do. Write this one down. Jesus is greater than going to church. That's what I'm talking about today. And for some of you today, you're going to hear something that I really believe that if you apply it to your life, listen, I don't think I'm overstating what I'm about to say. I believe what I'm going to say, what God's going to give you today, if you will apply it to your life, years from now, you, from now you're going to look back and you're going to say, that was the day that, that was the day when God started something in my life that changed my life, that changed my perspective on what it means to be a follower of Christ. So turn in and turn on your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. Let's get there. Two verses today, 24 and 25, and two points. And so, again, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about going to church or being the church. Look at that screen. Here's where we're at. You, you said it this morning, or maybe you said it this week. You said, let's go to church, or are we going to church? So, so listen, we're, we're at this uh, Route 66 Festival the last couple of days, and we're talking to people about the Lord when we get those opportunities, always looking for gospel conversations as, as God would allow us to do that. And so I'm talking to a guy and he tells me I go to church. I said, cool, man. That's awesome. Which one? This one or that one? And he names three or four and he's talking about that. And, and then he said, but going to church doesn't work for me. It might work for some other people, but it doesn't work for me. Going to church doesn't work for me. And here's what I told him, Bill, I'm going to use that name. Bill, it sounds like to me that you need to stop going to church. Bill needed to hear what 
Some of you perhaps today need to hear and get this. And don't miss it. God's highest calling for you as a follower of Christ was never to go to a church or a building. God's highest calling is not to go to a destination, but to be conformed to the image of God's only son, Jesus Christ. Not to go to church, but listen to this, but be planted in a church, a light that's shining in a dark world. That's God's highest calling for you and for me. So it's not about going to church. It's about being planted. It's about being planted in the house of God. Let's read it in verse 24. Here's what he says, Hebrews chapter 10. And let us consider, underline that, how we may spur, circle that one, uh, one another on toward love and good deeds, highlight those, not giving up meeting together, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit, <laughs> the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more, get this, all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, now remember the book of Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christians that found that following Jesus had put them at odds with the culture where they live. Uh, they were in conflict with the surrounding world. That sounds a little bit familiar, doesn't it? Or it should sound a little bit familiar. But in verse 24 and 25, we get one of the most important pieces of advice that was ever given to people that want to follow Jesus for the long haul. And so look at it again, verse 24, and let us consider how we may what? Spur one another on. Now, your translation may say stir up, or it may say motivate. It might even say stimulate. And those are all good words. Nothing wrong with that. But, but I just like this word spur that I see in the NIV. Maybe it's just the cowboy in me. I don't know. But, but, but the implication that, that it's not always super pleasant. The word he uses, he uses four times in the Bible, the only time you see it. And this isn't a cheerleader word. Let me, let, let's get to this. This isn't, hey man, you can do it. I believe in you. It's all going to be okay. You know, rah, rah. This is all going to, this is not that kind of word. Uh, this word is more like which part of your butt needs kicking to get you moving. Now, my mama is watching online, and she didn't like what I just said. Maybe you didn't either, but it illustrates the truth of this word. Sometimes what we need is not entirely pleasant. Are you with me? But it is entirely necessary. What are we spurring each other on to? That's what he says. Notice again in verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward what? To love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. There you go. Do you go to church or, or will you be the church? And, and, and there's a difference here. You see, this is where you really see the difference between going to church and being the church. That word considered comes from two Greek words, kato. Is, it means intensity. Uh, uh, noio is to think. It, it's, it's two words. So what he's saying is we're supposed to be thinking intensely with great intensity about how to move us to love and good works. Man, you need to get out the grease pencil or, or you need to get out uh, your whiteboard and you need to begin to write down strategies, effective strategies that spur us, spur one another on to this intentional loving and good works. Let me tell you about this word. This word is a come on man word. This word is, come on, man, let, let, let's be the church. Let's love God. Let's love people. Let's do some good stuff for the glory of the kingdom of God. And so the author of Hebrews is telling us we need to be constantly looking for ways to kick each other in the butt to keep us moving forward. And I know you may not like it, but here it is again. That's exactly what he's saying. You, you need to find ways to progress. And by the way, Progress is always good, right? Now, maybe progress is, is not always good, but now uh, here's what I want you to know. Good progress, the right kind of progress, progress can be pleasant. And here's what I really believe about that. It's really about making progress, isn't it? I mean, it's not always pleasant when you're making progress. We all love progress. We, we love to lose weight and we love to get better at our jobs or make the varsity team or, or move up at work. That all sounds good. We, we love it when we're deepening our marriages and we like overcoming addictions. We all like that, making progress, but we don't always like what it takes to make progress right? Because the reality is that making progress is often unpleasant. What we need is people around us to help push us past that pain that makes progress possible. And that's the reason 
people who might hire a personal trainer. Now, I've, I've never hired one. And you can look at me and say, okay, <laughs> yeah, we can see you've never hired one. It, it, it's, it's the reason why we go to Weight Watchers, maybe, or we join Alcoholics Anonymous. We, we recognize uh, that, that other people around us, uh, God can use them to help us in ways that we need. So here's the author of Hebrews. He gives us a command, and notice it's in command uh, phraseology. He, he gives us this command, and then he gives us the context, and you, you can't miss that in verse 25. Let's Let's read verse 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. That's what he said. He said, we always need to do this, but it's even more important as we see the day approaching. Now, what's the day? What's that about? It's not a day. Notice in scripture, and by the way, most translations will put this with a capital D. Don't let that go unnoticed. This is an important day. But, but what day is he talking about? You, you might already know he's talking about the soon return of Jesus. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. And the Bible sometimes calls that uh, the judgment day. And the Bible has a lot to say about that day. But one of the very clear ideas about that day is that Jesus wants to find us ready. You, you see, when Jesus returns, he wants to find us ready to greet him. He doesn't want to show up and we're like, oh you know, man, you know, I, uh, you didn't send me a a calendar notice, you know. It didn't pop up on my on my iPhone. I, I wasn't aware that today was the day that you were coming back. He wants us to be ready. Yeah, but, but what does that look like to be ready for the day? One of the foundational things you need to take care of to be ready, and get this one, this one is absolutely most important, and it's this. It's a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Have you received him? And, and, and I'm not talking about practicing a religion. I'm not talking about doing a bunch of spiritual things, but I'm talking about having a relationship with God that changes you from the inside out. It still amazes me that when I ask people if they are a follower of Jesus, and they will say something like this, well, I've gone to church my whole life. But that's not what I asked. I've spent a lot of time at Chipotle, but, but I, I'm not a burrito, you know? I, I, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me uh, for us to think in those terms, because it doesn't work like that. There's a moment when you have to commit, when you say, this is not about me and the things that I do, but it's about who I know. And it's about my willingness to put my faith and my trust in what Jesus has done for me on the cross and the resurrection. By the way, that's foundational. Having a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And if you're here today, think about this. If you're saying, I don't really have that, just hang on. We're going to help you with that in just a little while. How you can have that foundational, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. It is possible to go to church and not be the church. You understand? It's quite possible to go to church and not be the church. And Jesus is what coming back. What does the Bible say? He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for the church. Uh, so you say, well, I do have that relationship with Jesus. I, I know him. I've called on his name. I, I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by faith. I've asked him into my heart. Uh, but there's a few more things that he mentions. And, and maybe this one is something that that God speaks to you. One is loving others. Notice what he says, loving others. And by the way, that's what a family does. That's what God's family does. And he says to spur one another, one another on toward love. And it's interesting to me that he, that he uses the word agape here. Now, you guys who've been around church a while, you got this. You, you know what that word is. You know, we, we, we call that God's kind of love, that unconditional type of love. It, it's a love that God loves us with. And, and, and so we talk about this kind of love, agape love. It's usually not the kind of love that we love one another with. We love one another because we're, you're pretty and you cook. We love one another because, hey man, you please everything in my flesh. We love one another because we like what you bring to me. You see, but that's not the kind of love that he says that we're supposed to spur one another on toward. We're supposed to spur one another on toward the kind of love that God has. God's kind of love. 
And, and so it's interesting to me. And then he goes on. He says, not only loving others, but he says good deeds. That, that means living on mission. Uh, that has to do with extending your influence everywhere that you have influence. I get that. Every one of us has influence somewhere. And we're called to honor God and to extend his influence everywhere you have influence. You got to think about that. So in your marriage, check. In, in your family, Check. Everywhere where you have influence, in your apartment complex, check. At school, check. On your teams, check. In your neighborhood, check. In your car club, check. Wherever it is that you have influence, those are the places that God has put you in order to share his influence where you have influence. And so when Jesus returns, notice, we're ready when we are loving others. Notice what he says. When we're loving others in a way that he would want us to, and when we're living on mission. And Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, let me have you read that with me in verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven. This is a story Jesus is telling. Uh, and, and he says, at, at that time, what time? The, the day. When he returns, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, maybe you remember this story. Jesus Christ is the bridegroom uh, representing uh, the church. That's you and I. We are, the, we are these virgins. We are the ones who have been born again. So the ten virgins had lamps. And, and Jesus said five of them were foolish. Five of them were wise. Here's why. Because half of them didn't bring any oil for their lamps. Now, maybe they had some oil in their lamps, and they probably thought, well, that's going to do it, uh, but, but they didn't bring any extra oil. And, and, and it just dawned on me, get this, uh, this week as I was studying this passage again, that Jesus doesn't give us great odds here. <laughs> do, do you see it? Think about that. Half of them weren't ready. The other half was ready. It kind of makes you want to look at the person next to you and say, well, is it you or is it me? I mean, I, I wonder if Jesus looks at half of us and he says, man, you just don't get it. <laughs> half of you people just, you, you, you don't get it. And it's about being the church. It's not about going to church. I, I wonder if he's looking at about 50% of us saying, there's about 50% of you guys. Because, you know, because Jesus could have done this different had he chosen to. But, but I think it's significant that, that he said, you know, I'm choosing five, five foolish and five wise. And so he's, he's got them pretty evenly divided. He's saying there are some people out there that just don't get it. There are some people who are listening to me today that just don't get it. There are some people in this room today that just don't get it. You think this serving God is all about your attendance at church. You think that's the end of it all. I just need to go to church and check it off my list and I'm good to go. And so what you're doing is you're going to church. Maybe you haven't yet become the church. You're not being the church because what did he say? What is that? That's when we love with this kind of love that he's given to us to give to others and not only that, but it's also when we're doing the works that he sent us to do. It's interesting to me also that in this story that it occurs in groups. Did you get it? There's a group of five who were foolish and a group of five who were wise. Now, Jesus could have chosen one wise and one foolish had he chosen. And that would have been all right. But that's not what he did. What he did is he, he put these people in groups. And I think there's a principle here that... That you see, and you see this principle throughout the Bible. I heard someone call it this, the C3 principle. Write it down. It says this. It says that company creates character. In other words, the company we keep develops the kind of character that develops in us. It's the reason, it's the, reason the Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. It's the very reason why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be misled because bad company corrupts good character. And so here we go. Back to the story. Jesus puts the 10 virgins. Remember, they represent the church. They represent you and me. And he puts them in these groups. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch for us to say one group is going to church and the other group are being the church. But here's the problem. Most of us are not very intentional about the company we keep. 
We just kind of drift into relationships and our character becomes influenced by the company we keep. C3 principle. Matthew 25, Jesus said the five foolish ones didn't take any oil with them. Notice, I wonder if you can picture them. Here, here's the picture in my mind. The, the, there's five of them that he calls foolish. They didn't take any oil with them. And I want you to notice how influence works. Here, here's probably what happened. One of them said, well, you know, I'm not taking any oil. Oh, you, so you're not taking any oil? No, I'm not. Well, hey, I'm not going to take If you're not going to take any oil, I'm not going to take any oil. Do you see how that works? And then there's another one that's, that, that might say, well, you know, I, I'm taking some oil. And then someone else says, well, yeah, if you're taking oil, I'm taking oil too. Your company now is influencing your character. And Jesus says this, the wise ones took oil in their jars with their, with their lamps. Hey, 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 I'm taking some extra oil. Yeah, me too. Hey, you got a jar that I could borrow. Well, well, you know, if you're going to, I'm going to. You, you, you see how this works. And then the bridegroom, according uh, to Jesus, didn't show up for a long time. And then they all fell asleep. I want you to think about that because Jesus is coming back. The day is approaching. But it says that we all, all of us, have the potential to fall asleep while we're waiting for his return. In other words, we can drift into forgetfulness about this day, this day that is coming. There's the possibility that we won't be ready. So Jesus showed up in the store. The five foolish ones were out at the store. And they had run down to the store. Let's see if we can get some oil. We need to get some oil and get back because this thing's about to start. But when they come back, the Bible says the door was shut. They missed it. Here's the bottom line. Jesus is saying that it really matters to be ready. Jesus is saying if you're not ready, you're going to miss the party. So here's the question. The question really becomes how can I be ready? And just so you know, it's not about perfection. And, and get this one. It's all about progress. It's about progressing. You don't always get it right. I don't always get it right. But the question is, are you progressing, moving forward, moving toward love, joining him on mission? It's really about finding and taking this next step of obedience, of love and good deeds, and joining him on mission. And by the way, get this, there is always a next step. I mean, it doesn't matter if you've been saved a few days or you've been saved for 80 years, there is always a next step. So what's the context? So, so we get this command and it's clear, uh, but what is the context for us to take that next step of, of love and good deeds for joining him on mission? We'll go back to verse 25. In verse 25, Hebrews 10, he says, not giving up, Meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Write this one down. The context is about community. Not, not, and not just any community, but missional community. Being the church that spurs one another on to love and good works. It's all about community. Now, now taking the next step in obedience to Christ. That's what it's about. And, and you can't give up. He says, don't give up meeting together. So when I say stop going to church, I don't mean don't come. I mean don't just come to church. But be the church. And be the church on mission. So instead of going to church, we need to be planted in the house of God. You say, well, I like that language, but where does that language come from? Being planted in the house of God. Preacher, did you just come up with that? Did, did, did you wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh, wow, I think it would be cool to say, let's be planted in the house. No, I found that in Psalm 92. So I want you to get there. And I want to read verse 12 out of Psalm 92. So we are to be planted in the house of God. Notice what it says in, in uh, Psalm 92, verse 12, the righteous will flourish. And you don't, you don't want to go move too fast. The righteous will flourish, it says, like a palm tree. They will grow like, like a cedar of Lebanon. Verse 13, planted in the house of the Lord. Do you see? Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Now, now let me go back and get it again. Planted in the house of the Lord. Th that's where you flourish. The, the word flourish is kind of a weird word for us, isn't it? I mean, we don't use it much. I mean, you don't run around and say, man, I believe today I'm going to flourish. 
wow, Steve, you really look like you're flourishing today. I mean, it's just not a word that, that fits into our modern vernacular, right? So, so let me help you with what it means. The word flourish actually means to thrive. It means to prosper or progress, to progress, or it means to grow. And then he gives us some real illustrations to grow like a palm tree, to grow like a cedar tree. And the cedar tree gives us the idea of stability. They're deep-rooted. They're huge. And when Solomon was building his temple, he made the columns and the post and the roof out of cedar because he wanted a building that was designed to last for centuries. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have a cedar chest? Anybody got one of them cedar chest things? Okay, yeah, some of you. Or you built a closet or you did an add-on in your home and, and you decided, well, we're going to line that closet with cedar. That was pretty cool and you liked it. And, and, and you like it because it smells good, doesn't it? And then you throw those sweaty sweat, uh, those sweaty sweat socks in there and it just messes up the whole thing. No, but, but you, you have this cedar and there's a reason for it because it is strong and it lasts. But then there's the palm tree he talks about, symbolic of triumph and victory. A palm branch was given to the champion in the Corinthian games. And when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, you'll remember, it was known as what? The triumphal entry. And they waved the branches of palm trees at him. So the righteous, he says, is planted in the house of the Lord. And he says this, they will flourish, they will grow, they will progress. And, and by the way, this doesn't happen one Sunday a month. You might think I've picked Hebrews. Listen, this, we're in the book of Hebrews, right? And, and, and back when you're, you're coaching, there's sometimes there are dates on a calendar that you tend to circle. <laughs> you tend to say, man, I'm looking for this one. This was one I was kind of circling, and God changed my mind. He said, no, you don't get to circle it the way you want to circle it. But, but, but I'm going to give you what needs to be said about Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And this is not a sermon to beat up people and guilt them into thinking that I'm saying, man, you got to come to church. You got to come to church. You got to come to church. And with that said, let me just say, you need to come to church. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but let me also say, it's not so much about coming to church as it is about being the church. Planting yourself in the life, in the body of Jesus Christ so that you can flourish. Because here's what happens. Most people think, well, you're going to turn to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And now you're just going to start nailing us about, I need to do this and I need to do that. I need to do this and I need to do that. Here's, listen, you need to come to God's house and be planted in the house of the Lord because you're going to flourish. What kind of pastor would I be if I wouldn't tell you of what is going to happen in your life if you do what the scripture says to do, and that is to be planted in the house of the Lord. Don't just do it once a month. Come on. I, I mean, how are you going to plant in the house of the Lord if you just show up once a month? Now, I'm talking to people who are here all the time. I get it. You, you, you're, you're consistent in, in your attendance, and you're coming, and you're coming, and you I get it. And, and yet, there are a lot of folks that, man, like you see them about once a month, or once every two months, or every other week, maybe. I think it would absolutely amaze us if, if all the people who are members of Northwest Church, we'd be bringing chairs in. If they all showed up on one Sunday, but, but we tend to come in shifts and I don't get that, you know, but, 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 but maybe that is what it is. I will tell you that those folks who don't take advantage of what the scripture teaches are not going to flourish. They're not going to flourish. They may have some momentary, whatever, whatever, but the Bible is clear. You're going to flourish. These trees are evergreen trees. You notice that? They're happening all year long. They're not just showing up on Christmas and Easter. Notice in verse 13. Notice what happens here in verse 13. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Now, it doesn't say those who are going to church. It says those who are planted in the house of the Lord. And I love what it says in verse 14. L l let's get this. They will still bear fruit in old age. Flourish. And notice this. Flour here's an outline. You guys that want to teach or preach, here, here's your one. If you're, you want a three points, you got it. Flourish, fruit, and fresh. Right here. That alliterates quite nicely, doesn't it? Verse 14, they will bear fruit in their old age. They will stay fresh and green. Get the picture. And verse 15, proclaiming the Lord is upright and he is my rock. Now, now there's a difference. Get it? There's a difference between going to church and being the church. Have we made that point? 
See, when you're planted, you're connecting. What are you doing? You're connecting and you're growing and you're serving. And you're spurring one another on toward love and good deeds. Why? Because you're on his mission. You're not just coming to church. You are the church. And you're making a difference. And some of you might say, well, I'm going to church, but I'm not flourishing. You, you might be like Bill, the dude I talked to yesterday or the day before. Church isn't working for you. Well, I would say to you, it's time that you stop going to church. And then you start putting seed in the ground and you get planted because there's where a huge difference can take place in your life. And so the author of Hebrews, he writes it again. Let's read it again in verse 25. He says, don't give up. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So don't stop coming. Don't neglect the place you're supposed to be planted. Some translations say it like this. Do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together for such is the, uh, the practice of some. And, and, and you might have said this week, hey, are we going to church? I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty tired. <laughs> you, you're, you're here. Some other people may, may, may have said that and didn't show up. You know, there's a football game on today after all. I mean, hey, season's beginning. It, 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 and it, it, Well, maybe we do go because, you know, if we go to church, there, there, there's that restaurant, you know, we really like. So, so man, that's cool. And, and, well, maybe we don't go to church because, you know, the kids really don't like going to church. So, so, so maybe we don't. And then you ask, are we going to church? But, but when you're planted, you don't say that. <laughs> see, see, the people who just go to church say that. But when you're planted, you don't say that. You don't use that language anymore. You don't say, are we going to church? You know why? Because the church for you is not a destination which you attend. The church is a posture of who you are because now you're planted and you know the church is who you are and you're going to go to the church because you're going to worship. You need that worship and you know the value of worship so you're going to go and you're going to go to church. Why? Because you're going to encourage somebody. You know God is going to use you as an encourager and you don't come uh, late and leave early. You come early and you stay late because you're looking for someone who needs spurred on. You're making Making sure that someone fills out a connect card and that they get greeted and that they get loved on and they get a hug that they need and they get the encouragement they need. And you're all about that because you're planted and your roots are growing deep in the family of God because you are the church. You're not just coming. And then you get connected. Because here's the deal, you're being blessed. And when you're being blessed, you want to be a blessing. And you're going to spur someone on to love and good works because you're planted. And it's your identity. You're the church. And I love that word. Maybe you've heard that word a lot in your life, that word church. That word church is a Greek word, ecclesia. It shows up 114 times in the New Testament. And it means this. It means gathering or assembly. Now, I know about the church universal. Some of you are already saying, you're way ahead of me. You say, well, preacher, what about the church universal? And I get it. Yeah, everyone who has been born into the kingdom of God is a part of what we would call the church universal. But, but I want you to notice this, and this is an important distinction in Scripture. Because the majority of the times you see the word ecclesia, it's talking about a local body of believers, a local congregation. And it is a group of people that are banded together, baptized, and they are being the church, serving the Lord, and reaching out with love and good works. That's where you see it. So that's why you don't blow it off. And that's why you don't neglect it. That's why you don't give up meeting together. Uh, it's habit forming, he says. It, it, you can get into a bad habit of, of not coming and being the church. It's really easy to get into the habit of not gathering. Have you noticed that? I mean, you, you, you can miss one week and it's easier to miss the next week. And before long, you're just out of the habit. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, I, I've, I, you know, Brenda and I, we have our treadmills and they're, they're downstairs in the basement and I've, I've got my universal weight machine and I, I've got some other free weight that, and, and I can't tell you how many times Monday morning we're going to get started. 
And so Sunday night, that means we can just pig out. We can, we can order that Godfather's pizza and get the extra cheese and, and do whatever we want. Because you know why? Because Monday's coming, right? And, and Monday, we're going to be down there on that treadmill. Man, we're going to knock out about three to five miles on the treadmill. I'm going to get in there and do, do, do some different sets and lap pulls. And I'm going to do some curls for the girls. And I'm going to do all of these things, right? So I'm going to get in there and get it done. Monday, it's going to happen. Monday rolls around and I say, yeah, you know. And I've got a lot to do today. Instead of getting out of bed at 4.30 in the morning, rolling down there to the basement. No, I, nah. Mm-mm. So Tuesday, I say, well, I'll just do that tomorrow. And, and when you miss Monday, it makes it a lot easier to miss Tuesday. And, and then, you know, Wednesday rolls around and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, well, I didn't go Monday or Tuesday. So why should I start in the middle of the week? I, next Monday, it'll happen. Next Monday, it'll get going, right? And so you're always looking for that Monday. It's just so easy to get out of the habit. Maybe you should decide here, you know what? I don't need to go to church. What I'm going to do is just watch it online. I'm just going to watch it online. But let me say this. Watching online is not the same as gathering. Now, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm going... I'm going to go positive with this in a minute. So just so you know, watching online is not to say, I, I, I can promise you, and you know that I'm all about providing an online experience. We're doing that right now. And we have people from uh, different places in our country and even in some foreign countries that tend to be with us every Sunday. And that's cool. Uh, and I think it's a good thing for those people who are sick from time to time, and they're unable to gather and come to the house of God. There's some reasons, perhaps, maybe they live in Zimbabwe or Wyoming or one of those foreign countries or whatever. Uh, I, I mean, I love the fact that my dad is watching us today online. He's usually, if he's not preaching, he, uh, he's attending, and, and then he'll pick up with us later on sometime. I love the fact that he can go and celebrate and worship and be a part of what's happening here at Northwest. I love the fact that it's a tremendous outreach tool. What we do online is a tremendous outreach tool because somebody's hearing about Jesus. And, and if they come across uh, us as we're, as we're experiencing this worship experience and, and they hear the name Jesus and, and, and God convicts them, I think that's awesome. I think another ex- a good benefit is sometimes it's a way to introduce people to us so that we can share the gospel. I'm all about it. I really am. And matter of fact, I, I think we should even be doing more. We should be doing more, finding more opportunities. Uh, as a matter of fact, we ought to be considering strategically planning and looking at ways to get this gospel into every crevice of this world. But it's not the same as gathering. <laughs> Did I say that already? I, it, it really isn't. Because here's, here's the deal. You can't hug someone through the screen. I mean, it's just not going to happen. You can't come to the altar with a friend and pray with them when they need encouragement. You can't do that. And we do have some lame excuses for not coming. And, and I, I, I get that. But, but let, me, let me give you an out right here. I think we have some excuses, some legitimate excuses or reasons. Let me just call them reasons. I mean, you need a vacation, right? So if you look at me and say, preacher, you sure need a vacation. We all do. I mean, you, you do. You need some time away. There's no doubt about that. Jesus did that. He withdrew from the throngs of people to get alone. What was he doing? He was talking to the Father. I mean, you might get sick. And, and, and your work may call you out to do something on a Sunday so that you can continue to support your family. I get that. But let me tell you this quickly. Those are always to be the exception and not the rule. Because you're planted. You're planted in the house of the Lord. You're planted. And when you're planted, you don't want to miss. And it's not about the building or the destination. Because what you're missing is the gathering of the body of Christ. And you don't want to miss that. I love the fact that in the old days, I, you know, I grew up in the pastor's home, as you well know. And, and man, I used to remember... You know, sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, whatever. Uh, they would be letting my dad know that they're not going to be in church this Sunday. We're not going to be there because, you know, we got this and this and this. And just wanted to let you know. I used to think that was so weird. I, and, and, and as I grew and as God called me to preach and I began to pastor and people would do that to me. I, I, early on, I made a terrible mistake. I used to say to people, listen, I don't really need to know. Okay. You don't need to tell me that. 
And, and, and over the years, I began to realize, yeah, you need to tell somebody that. You need to tell somebody you're not going to be there. Because if you're the guy that's handing out the bulletins back there, and we don't have bulletins, I've been corrected on that. We have listening guides. Man, we are modern, contemporary, super cool. Anyway, so, so we don't have book, but we have, li- and, and, and if you're the guy doing that, and you decide not to show up, or you can't show up for whatever reason, let me, just, let me say, Jim, I'm not talking to you, and I know you're watching this online today. You and Verna uh, are on vacation. God bless you. We hope you're having a wonderful time. We're praying for your safe return. But that brings up another point. We knew Jim and Verna were going to be gone today. So who jumped in to hand out the listening guides today? Who was standing there like Jim always does on a Sunday morning? Who, who was the plug? You know, in athletics, we talk about the plug. I, my quarterback went down, do I have a plug? I got to get somebody on the field because the game needs to go on. And worship needs to continue. And we need to continue to love and encourage and, and, and spur one another on to good work. So who's going to take his place? If you're a teacher in this, in this place and you teach at Northwest and, and you're going to be gone. You let somebody know. If you're planted, you probably need to let somebody know. Because if you're planted, it means you're involved, you're hooked up, you're connected, you're growing, and you're serving. And you're doing something with the gifts that God has given you through the body of Christ. And so if you're not going to be there, the body's going to suffer. I I say to some of you guys, and you know it, if if you're on the crew and, and, and you're not here, I always say, you know, we're just not as good when you're not here. It's not as good. It's not as good when, when, when you're not running that camera or that camera. It's just not as good when, when, when the person that's supposed to be dealing with the online and, and, and communicating with people and saying, hey, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? How can we can occur? And when that person doesn't show up, it, it, it's just not as good. And, and we're scrambling around trying to find people. L- let me give you a news flash today. There is a place for every person under the sound of my voice to serve and plant themselves at Northwest Church. And by the way, man, it's for your own flourishing. <laughs> it is. And if you will do that, listen, if you'll do this simple command and follow it in the context that's given in Scripture and plant yourself, you're going to flourish. You're going to dig it more than anybody else. I see, people think, well, you know, preacher, you're trying to get me to do this, trying to get me to do that. <laughs> I just want you to grow. <laughs> I mean, what kind of pastor would I be if I didn't encourage you to thrive? I mean, really, think about it. I mean, let me tell you something. This, this is absolutely, let me get real and practical. Can I do that for just a few minutes? I'm going to get real and practical. I want to tell you about Bill and Ted. Can I tell you about Bill and Ted? I mean, who doesn't like an excellent adventure, right? And some of you got that. But I want to tell you about Bill first. Bill goes to church and he hears the gospel and he's worshiped and God got a hold of his heart and he gives his life to Jesus and his life has changed, man. What happens to Bill? He doesn't really get connected. Now think about that. He doesn't really get connected with other people. And, and Bill, bless his heart, he may not be, he's kind of introverted anyway. So, so he's not the kind of dude that's going to reach out and try to, to get connected. And so part of it's Bill's fault, but we can't blame it on Bill completely because part of it is our fault. Because no one reached out to him. And no one came to Bill on that, on that day when he gave his heart to Christ. And, and no one really kind of gathered around him and said, Bill, let me trade numbers with you. Hey, Bill, I'm in a connect group and we meet on Thursday nights. Hey, Bill, I teach a Sunday school class here in this building. And man, I'd love, hey, Bill, I'm, I'm involved in a men's group. Hey, Bill, I'm hooked up with the CMA. I see you rode in here on a, on a motorcycle kit. I, there's some places where you and I, where I can help you get connected. One of the dangers about us as one of the saddest things about us as a church is so oftentimes we talked about connecting but people come in the front door and they go out the back door just as quick people say well that's because of the preaching you know okay no well that's because of the music that's because we don't have pews and we have chairs. That, that's because they didn't like this. They didn't like that. That's because they're, in, they're engaged in consumerism. And, and they're, they're shopping out this church thing, you know. I just go shop it out. And if I like it, I mean, people say, well, I went to that church and I didn't like it. 
How about going to the church that God sends you to, whether you like it or not, and you plant yourself in the place where he wants you to plant, and you become that person who is connected and growing and serving. Listen, Bill, poor Bill. Bill didn't get connected. And so a couple of years down the road, what happens to Bill is he no longer comes to church. Maybe he comes occasionally, or maybe he doesn't come at all. Bill. His marriage starts to fall apart and his kids are a mess and he shouldn't have bought that boat and he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have done those things. He, he shouldn't have got involved in whatever he got involved in. He no longer is involved in the church. He's not plugged in. He's not connected and he's suffering. Let me tell you about Bill. Bill is not flourishing. He's not flourishing. Yeah, yeah, he can go to church, and certainly he came to know the Lord, but Bill's not flourishing. But, but let's go to Ted. All right, let's talk about Ted. Ted comes to church. He, God speaks to him. He's, God moves in his heart. He comes to know the Lord, and then Ted develops some relationships. He, he gets involved. He, he, he joins a connect group. He's, he's hooked up in a connect group, and, and, and he's doing life with others. And maybe he's handing out connect cards, and, and he's running a camera, or, or he's teaching a men's class, and he's praying for someone, and someone is praying for Ted. Instead of just going to church, he plants himself, and his roots begin to grow deep, see? Because he now knows the church is not a destination. It's an identity that he embraces. And the roots begin to grow deeper. And it's not always perfect. Understand, when the winds blow in Ted's life, and they will. And storms come in Ted's life, just like they do in yours. And, and, and yet when they blow, they don't blow him away. Because he's connected. And he's growing. And he's serving. Do you see the difference between Bill and Ted? And so the natural question is, which one are you most like? I, I mean, it makes all the difference if you're Bill or if you're Ted. And there's one more word I want you to get, and let's get it quick in verse 25. And don't miss this one. Here's what it says. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging. Write that one down. Encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I, I don't know. Do you, do you see that word? Encouraging. It ought to jump off the page. That's what we do. Because we're planted. That's what we do because that's who we are. The church. That's why, that's why we show up. That's what every one of us needs. And we need it even more because why? The day is approaching. We need that. <laughs> that's why before you leave today, the Holy Spirit of God ought to lay on your heart. If you're planted, he'll do this. He'll lay on your heart somebody that you see in this building today. I wonder about the guy that said about uh, two rows back. Man, I hope I'm not going to be embarrassing anyone. We're still running live. But, but, but he sat right back there, kind of in front of Larry. Uh, I, I believe it was last week. I'd never seen him before. And I, I couldn't get to him because he hit the door running. I, did anybody know? I'm not asking you to raise your hands or, or saying, did anybody talk to him? I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe you're so planted that, that you were sensitive to that and you made a connection with that man and now we might be able to follow up. I don't know. I didn't see a connect card. I don't know. But that's why we're here. Do you guys understand? That's why we're here. It's to spur one another on to love and good works. No, no, no. We're not here in order for us to check off the box. No, 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 listen, we're here in order to spur one another on to love and to good works, and we're to be encouraging. I guarantee you there's a family that came into this building this morning, and this week they were told some awful news. I know this to be a fact. My wife and I went to their home or went to where they were living, and I wonder how many people or encouraging them. Or, and and now, now, let, me, let me tell you, here's part of the deal. When you are planted and you're flourishing, then you, you, listen, your leaves are going to be strong. You're going to be green, right? There's going to be fruit, the Bible says. You're going to be growing. And what that means is you're going to be looking around for other people. It's amazing, these giant redwoods, and you know some of the story about them. They have roots that grow so deep. But one of the things that's amazing to me is they spread out horizontally, about 60 to 80 feet. And, and, and they intertwine with other trees. The, the, the ecosystem of those giant redwoods are interesting to look at. But because really what they're doing is they are encouraging one another. 
They're growing together. They're sharing the nutrients. They're experiencing the growth together, and they need one another. And they live for thousands of years feeding off of one another. They need each other to survive. And you might even say they're encouraging one another. Somebody said encouragement is oxygen to the soul. And I like that because that's what happens in the church. So don't give up because somebody needs your encouragement. The church is God's idea. And by the way, understand, it's, it's not the church of Paul. It's not the church of Steve. It's not the church of Judy. No, it's God's church. And Jesus said about his church, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You, you need the house of the Lord, so don't give up. Stay connected. It's interesting to me that it takes time to grow. And now every good farmer knows that. I mean, even if you plant a garden, you got that. So you have to stay connected. He is the vine, the Bible says. We are the branches. Do not forsake the assembly of yourself. Don't just go to church, but be planted. It's important. And here's what you need, right? Here's what you need is you need soil. You need light. You need water. You need temperature. You need time. It takes good soil. You know, the Bible talks about our hearts as, as being soil. You remember the sower went out to sow, and some of the seed fell here, fell there, fell there. But, but the seed that took root and grew fell on good soil. That's good soil. So, so when you come into God's house and you gather, according to the scripture, you gather, the word of God is going forward, and it needs to find good soil. Good soil, if it's going to grow. Good soil. What does that mean? You come into this place expecting God to speak to you. And you grow. But, but you also need light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. <laughs> He's come to dispel the darkness. He even called you that too. He said, you're the light of the world. You, 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 you need light in order to grow. You need water. <laughs> Jesus said, if you come and you drink of the water that I have, you'll never thirst again. I'm the living water, he said. Well, I better get a few amens. You guys getting this? Jesus said, I'm the living water. You don't ever thirst again. And, and then you need temperature because he said, now, now, now hang in here because I'm going to send the comforter to you. <laughs> the Holy Spirit to you. To, to indwell you. And what the Holy Spirit's going to do is to convict you. The Holy Spirit is going to guide you. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one that says, Amen, when the Word of God is proclaimed and it's rightly divided and the truth of God is shared and the Holy Spirit says, Yeah, yeah, that's it. The Holy Spirit begins to warm your heart. There's just some temperature. The Holy Spirit begins to move in your life when you recognize, You know what? I've been going to church and I need to get planted. See, that's the Holy Spirit doing that. You might think that's a preacher doing that. Huh? Imagine that. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, man. And then what you need is time. That's one of the things, one of the mistakes we make is we just think it's going to happen like that. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time doing all of those things that we just talked about in order to see that growth in your life. It takes time. So when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. <laughs> Don't you wish you had? Yeah. But you didn't. So when is the next best time? How about now? Didn't do it 20 years ago, but I can do that now. When is the best time to be planted in the house of the Lord? Well, 20 years ago. And some of you did. Or maybe some of you didn't. So when is the best time to be planted in the house of the Lord? Now. You, you, do you see how that works? <laughs> now. When is the next time for you to begin to flourish? Now. He said this day, this day of the Lord, this day is coming and so we need to be ready. And, and so we plan our lives into the house of the Lord. And then notice what he said. You're going to flourish. You're going to flourish. I was going to end with a story, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'll save it for later. But here's what I am going to tell you. There's a question. I'm going to ask you to stand and 
bow your heads for just a minute if you would. And, and maybe today you would say, maybe you would say, you know, I want to be honest with the Lord. I'm going to ask you not to look around. If you, if you honestly would just pray and, and not look around. Because here's my question. It's a personal question. If you would honestly say, I'm not planted. Man, I, I really trust. I, I defined what that means, at least to some degree today, to be planted. And if you would say honestly and truthfully before the Lord, I'm not planted. I'm not planted. Nobody's looking around. Nobody. You just raise your hand and say, I, I, I'm, I go to church, but I'm really not planted. Is that you? I'm not planted. You are the same. Maybe you couldn't raise your hand, or maybe, maybe I didn't explain it well enough. I don't know. But if the Holy Spirit of God is leading you today to recognize, hey, the reality, the truth is, I'm not planted. I'm going to church, but I'm not planted. Then I'm going to challenge you today. You know. <laughs> I, I did this one time in a church I was pastoring. I, I went around the community where I was pastoring and I picked up pamphlets and brochures from every other church in town. Or most of them, I guess. And I brought them out in the foyer and I, on one Sunday, the Holy Spirit of God led me to say, listen, if you're not going to get planted here, there's some brochures of some other churches in the foyer. Now, this doesn't sound like what a pastor would normally do, Right? But maybe I'm not a normal pastor because I read this and I see that it's not about a building or a destination. It's not about a designation. It's about God getting you to the place where you can be planted and you can flourish. And if you can't flourish here, please, please go to that place where you can. But I want to tell you, there are opportunities aplenty in this place for you to flourish we're going to be faithful to the truths of God's word and preach it faithfully we're not going to preach the US News and World Report we're going to preach the 66 books of God's written revelation and let the Holy Spirit do his job we're going to teach in men's groups and women's groups and we're, we're praying and we're teaching in children's groups and youth groups and we're gathering together in small groups to do some life together, to really do some hard work of growth and discipleship. And if you want to plant your life so that you can flourish, those are some of the things that you can begin to engage in. So if that's you today and God has spoken to your heart, these altars are open. I just invite you to come. Say, hey, I want to be planted I want to be planted today in the house of the Lord. Father, we come to you. We ask you to move in this place. Speak to every heart and life. Draw us, God, as you speak. And give us courage and boldness to respond. We pray it in Jesus' name.